What's up guys? I got a question from one of the boys. And I wrote it down here so I'll read it out loud to you. And do my best to answer this to the best of my abilities. So the question from was from a guy named John Milius, I think it is, or Milius, I'm not sure. It says, I wonder, did you ever ask God to send you a loving wife as well? So there's two questions in here. Um, and the second one is, and when you see degenerate faithless people all around you, are praised and showered with love, friends, and everything good this world has to offer. Does that ever make you question your faith? So, I'm likely going to be rereading that a lot because I want to hit this from different angles. And I'll try to keep this short because I'm not here to waste your time. I want to give you value. But to answer the first question right away, do you ever ask God to send you a loving wife? Okay, well, yes, I have. But at the same point in time, I also realize that some of the best men in history didn't have wives. And I believe that you should get married for the purpose of family, more so. Obviously, you still can totally get married and not have kids. That's fine. But um, having a wife, let alone having a wife and kids, is incredibly taxing on your time, your money, your resources, and your, I don't want to say your potential, but you know, a good wife should be your helpmate and can, in theory, raise your potential. But... Um, that's very um, hard to balance a lot of those things. A lot of the really good and best men that accomplished a lot in their lives did it um, single. And, you know, they had brotherhood. Or some type of other, uh, something else. And they, sometimes they were completely on their own. Um, but to answer your question, do I? I have. But then a lot of times I go back and I pray again and I say, God... If it's your will to let me have a wife, um, if it's your will, sorry, if it's your will to not let me have a wife, I'm, I'm not supposed to, then I say, please help me to stop worrying about it and I just focus on the mission, focus on what I gotta do next, what's in front of me. Now, if, and I always ask afterwards to us, say, God, if it is your ability, if it is your, within your plan, within your plan for me, for me to have a wife, then please help me to, again to stop worrying and to let it just happen on your timing and not my own. That's typically how I handle that. I don't actively look for women. I mean, I have asked a couple of girls out when I was younger, but you know, I never really went anywhere with any of those, thankfully. I, I, was, I was a dumb kid. I would have done something stupid, but um, I rejected a fairly amount of decent, girl, decent looking girls and stuff. And again, I'm not trying to be, I'm not. God's gift to women. I'm not even that good looking, but it's just, um, yeah. Sorry. Next question. <laughs> and when you see how degenerate, faithless people are all around you, praised and showered with love, friends, and everything good this world has to offer, does that ever make you question your faith? Well, for starters, I'm this is the language that you choose to use to describe those things and the way you wrote that I'm going to go on a big limb or assumption and assume that you're either not a Christian or you're not a born again Christian the use of the word good to describe what the world has to offer immediately made me consider to think that you probably weren't a Christian and then to make me question my ask if I question my faith based on I guess you could say the fear of missing out on these quote unquote good things and again, I don't want to make a whole lot of assumptions, but just on what I little I know about you, maybe I should have asked you beforehand before I made a video. Um, and again, this is no hate to it to you. I'm doing my best to answer your question. Um, I'm assuming you're writing this from the perspective of, of not being a Christian, but looking from the outside in. And seeing Christian as a lifestyle, like like a, a thing you do, or... Because real Christianity, it's it's traditional Christianity. It's more than that. It's a, a true relationship with God. And on the outside looking in, it looks like just like a, something you practice. That's a good way to put it. Something you practice. Um, it looks like I'm living in... The, it might look like I'm living in a bubble and I'm not allowed to step outside of that and have sex or uh, have friends or have lots of praise. And these things aren't necessarily good and they're not necessarily bad. Now, for the starters, I'm assuming by love, and you can have a loving, you know, relationship with the wife, and you can have sex within the confines of marriage, but by love, I'm assuming you mean, like, having girlfriends, or potentially losing your virginity, and, uh, you know, 
outside doing things outside of marriage. I'm assuming that's what you mean by love. Um, multiple partners? No. Okay. Some people do the um, do the example of. Okay. Well, I want to backtrack first. Now, when you're a Christian and you understand these things, and this is true in psychology, it doesn't matter if you believe in evolution, if you're an atheist, or you're a Christian. Um, there are detrimental side effects to doing these these activities. Um, specifically, I'm talking about sex right now, but um, and this is in psychology. It's also in other stuff. The more partners you have, the less fulfilling your relationship is. The act of sex itself is again less fulfilling, um, less fun. The more partners you've had. Now, a lot of people they use the um, they use the tape analogy that the more times you take tape and you stick it on something and reapply it, it becomes less and less sticky and eventually you can't really stick to whatever it is that you're sticking it to. In other words, the more people you've been with, the harder it is to connect to that person. But I like using the soul tether slash tie um, analogy, which I think I have not came up with. I think Elliot Hulse made that one up. Um, but basically, when you do something with someone, you kind of, there's two people, imagine my fingers are two different people, and you're like tied together. Um, there's, there's a deep connection, there's deep roots between you two after doing that, and um, marriage is actually supposed to be pretty beautiful because the, you know, the people say, remember your first time, or I heard before, I hope you love your first as you last, stuff like that. It's the way it's supposed to be, like, it's supposed to have a deep connection with someone after you find out you like them, after you find out you're compatible, after all the stuff, and then you go into that, and then you have a very fulfilling relationship. You ever see atheist couples, who, even couples that have just been together since they were teenagers in school? They accidentally do it right. That's what that's 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 what it is. Um, but anyways, I digress. The soul tie one. I like that one better because the moment you introduce another person into this mix, you're tied to another person, and you have less of a connection to that one. And eventually, after a while, you end up being caught in the middle of the spider web, and you can't really connect to anyone anymore. That's the way I typically look at it. Um, but both analogies are not necessarily incorrect or correct, but. Um, in psychology, and there's all kinds of studies you can look into, um, there are very detrimental side effects to partaking in those activities and having multiple partners. I'm assu Again, I'm assuming that is what you meant by love. If not, then you can just have totally loving relationships between, obviously, a girlfriend or a wife. A girlfriend without, you know, extra, you know, doing things outside of marriage. And I don't want to keep using the S word a whole lot, but... Um, and you can also have loving relationships with people that are, again, not partners. Um, you can have you can have brotherhood. You know, you can you can you know. Back when I was on the swim team, I remember um, I I would sound weird to say I love the other guys, but we had like this camaraderie thing. And whenever we beat the other team at the other school, it was like, yeah, we got them. We did it. It was us. So you can, if that's what you mean by love or relationships, you can totally have that outside of. Within the confines of Christianity. Now, the next one was... Let me check this again. Um, you, you mentioned praise. So, when you have a deeper understanding of people and how uh, bad and detrimental a lot of these activities and these people are, the things that they promote, um, you can't really enjoy them with a, when you know what the side effects are. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is specifically uh, food. Um, sodium benzoate. Now, sodium benzoate, when it's in high enough concentrations in the body, can actually cause genetic damage. Sodium benzoate is in pickles. It's in um, so, uh, most of your energy drinks, including rain. I love rain, but I had to stop drinking it. Um, I think it's, it might be in bubblegum, might not be in bubblegum, but it's in a lot of things. And, you know, a little bit's fine, but most people eat a lot of junk food. The people who eat junk food typically eat a lot. And if you like pickles, you like... If you drink energy drinks, you drink this, you drink that, or you do this and that, you eat this and that, you're actually damaging your body on a genetic level. And again, this could just be a total BS study, but this is one thing I'm trying to I'm going to try to paint a picture for you, an analogy. So you go, you engage in these activities that are fun and whatever else, but they're actually destroying you. And after you learn about this stuff with Christianity, you know that that these things ultimately lead you to hell, that they ultimately lead you to hell on life as well as in life. Hell on Earth as well as Hell after Earth. It's hard to enjoy them when you know the consequences of death. Um, in more than one way. So, again, there's some context. Now let's moving forward to praise. So, I don't know about you, but my life... 
I experienced a lot of things, addiction, a lot of things at a young age. Um, not alcohol, I would say alcoholism, just a teeny tiny bit. I had some relatives, again, I'm half Mexican, and uh, they're all alcoholics, and they all gave me all kinds of alcohol when I was a kid, and I experienced a lot of these things. I went to a nightclub, I shouldn't have, but, you know, they were a Mexican run place, and they didn't check for IDs. Most people went legal. Um, i seen a lot of things that I shouldn't have seen at a young age, and experienced a lot of things I shouldn't have experienced at a young age, and I'm telling you that this is all empty. And I'm supposed to be talking about praise, but I'll get back to that in a second. Um, and these people around me, you know, they, they, they excited when I when a fifteen year old drinks another beer. You know, uh, there's it's they give you praise, pat on the back, and keep in mind I'm no better than you as a Christian. I am a Christian because I know I need God because I'm not a good person because I need a savior. Um, so when it when it comes to praise, um. Why would you want to see, receive praise from another degenerate? And again, we're all equally bad in our own ways. Um, not equally, but we're all evil on some level. Uh, some obviously far more than others. But imperfection is imperfection in the eyes of God. You can't enter heaven if you're not perfect or forgiven. So, and with that in context, um, why would you want to receive praise from another fallen human being? That's not very good. I'd rather do things that are good and receive praise from God receive things from God, spiritual gifts from God, have a stronger relationship with God. So, in other words, I don't partake in these activities that have a stronger relationship with God. I stay away from evil. I don't clean up my mind with alcohol and other these, these other things. Yeah, I lose praise that I could potentially be gaining from these people. But let me make an analogy. So, imagine, and again, I'm not saying any of your friends are monsters or anything, but imagine if you had a friend that was, or a rel not a relative, let's say an acquaintance, um, uh, yes, okay, let's use a better analogy, actually. Let's say you built a sculpture, a really nice sculpture. Now, a pedophile, rapist, murderer, killer, Jeffrey Dahmer-esque type person comes up to you and says, Really nice job, dude. His opinion's worth garbage to you. Why do you want his praise? But then a master sculptor comes up afterwards and says, This is a beautiful work of art. This is amazing. Now, whose opinion are you... Do you care about more? Whose praise is more valuable to you? The person that was a bottom feeder of the earth, let's just say, the other person I described, or someone who is a man of prestige, someone that actually knows what they're doing, some someone that's in that craft but at a, a high level of mastery, let's say. Now going back to humans versus God, would you rather have the praise from God or have the praise from people? And when you realize that you get all, like I said in my previous videos, when you go to the Christ pill, you get all of the con, uh, you get, I'm sorry, you get all of the pros and none of the cons, plus more pros that are unique to the Christ pill. So, I hope that answers your question about praise. And again, one thing I want to hit on again before I start rereading what you said and answering more, more of that question. Um, again, I'm trying to paint the picture that the things from the world are not nearly as good as they seem. And I'm going to go out on another limb. And make another assumption, and I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting to you, I'm not trying to slander you, I'm trying to answer your question, I'm not making assumptions, and I maybe I should have asked you a few questions before I uh, made this video, but I'm assuming what you define as good is what feels good to you. So, again, feelings are not real, they're just motions and um, uh, movement in the body, as Elliot Hulse would say. Um... They're not something that you should base your life around. A feeling, something that feels good, may not necessarily be good for you. Again, going back, going back to the previous analogy of sodium benzoate in the pickles, and energy drinks, and the things that are slowly killing you, and you know whatever. Just because something feels good does not mean it's good for you. Even if it seems good and there's no negative side effects, and it doesn't mean there won't be negative side effects after Earth. So as a Christian, it is you don't enjoy these things. On many levels, one, because you know it's wrong, two, because you know it's making God angry, three, because you know the side effects of these things on earth and after, and uh, that's, that's pretty much it, yeah, those three things, it's like you can't really enjoy these things, you don't miss out because you wouldn't have liked them anyways. Once you take that pill, be it red or prefer preferably Christ, you understand things on a higher level, by the gift, grace of God, not by your own means. Um... It's, it's totally, it's a different thing, and it's something you have to experience to, to, to fully appreciate. Christianity is not a practice, it is truly something, a relationship with God. And very few Christians are like that. And again, I'm not very good, I'm like, again, as far as born-again Christians go, I'm probably on the bottom of the bow, I'm really not that great, but I try it. And I'm, I am getting better, but it's a work in progress. So next, 
part of this question I want to answer. Showered with love, friends, and everything this world has to offer. Everything good, again, I don't think what the world has to offer, any of it is good. Uh, friends. I have lost a lot of friends, and I don't really regret any of it, because none of them were worth having. None of them wanted to actually improve themselves. And I used to think, because I went to school, that you're friends with someone because you sit down, you make a joke with them in class, and now you're friends, or you like the same, if you even, you know, when I was a little kid, and this is, you know, natural, little kids interact, and I was, like, playing with toys, and little Sally comes up, and we find out we have the same favorite color or something, and now we're best friends. But truly, as an adult, friends, friendship it should be something along the line of... Should, friendship could be described as iron sharp and iron. With, truth, with friendship as an adult, there should be a level of transaction. In other words, you two should be making each other better. In other words, brotherhood. That's your goal. Not just having fun or having friendly acquaintances. That's not, that shouldn't be the goal because it's not going to lead you to somewhere better in life. You should always be trying to become better. Trying to be more like Christ, trying to be a better person, not trying to be, I don't know, the likable guy. Because at the end of the day, it's empty, a hundred years from now, but everybody will be dead and no one will remember, you know, except for God. And that's what's going to matter. So, again, let's go back. I um, want to reread this again. Uh, if you think this world has to offer, does that ever make you question your faith? No. I, I, I'm glad you answered you asked this question. This is a, a good question, and it was a great topic for me to make a video on. Uh, but does it ever make me question my faith? In other words, what I think I'm getting from you is that do I ever wish I wasn't a Christian so I could partake in these bad activities? On some level, because I am human, I have temptations, and yes, there are some, there's a period of times in my, in my life where a thought creeps into my mind. I'm like, you know, if I didn't reject such and such girl, that would have been really awesome because I would have done A, B, C, X, Y with her. And there's been some attractive women I've turned down in my life. There's been some attractive uh, opportunities to do bad things I've turned down in my life. And for the uh, 90% of the time, I don't regret it. But there is a uh, temptation that creeps into my life where I think, yeah, I could have had that girl. Yeah, I could have done this. Yeah, I could have done A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But does it ever make me question my faith or regret being a Christian? Knowing what I know as a Christian and knowing what I know even just as an educated person, and I'm not that educated, but I'm not even as educated as you, um, the answer is no. So to sum it all up, the first question uh, you asked, yes. The second question, no. Um, I don't want to waste your time. I hope that helps. I hope that answered all of your questions to the best of my ability. And again, I know that wasn't a very long question. I turned it into a 17-minute answer. I started writing a novel in the comments, and I was like, this is this this is a good, a good topic for a video. Um... So I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you gained something from that, and I hope someone else can watch this and potentially learn something uh, of value from this. Um, if you like my content, please leave a like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Um, leave a comment telling me why I'm wrong, ask for another topic on another video, um, leave a like, tell me I'm great, tell me I suck, whatever. Thank you for watching, have a good night, and uh, stay safe out there, dude.